we're just showing a quick video of the bird itself here. And then we're going to jump into the behind the scenes stuff that Joe's filmed here. Just the main neighbor. Wooden area. Or preparation area. A little short. And big sets and get heavy more. Um, there's a couple of pages for the babies at the bottom. There's the box. These boxes are probably pretty big, you know, I'm assuming 10 inches deep, probably high. Sometimes they buy cocks and ends, so when people do buy them, the more in, in good condition. But when the night is when the nice, when the weather is nice, we can't restrict them from getting outside. So, there's um, plenty of in there. And then, as time gets on in the year, we need more space for babies. So, uh, this is a sale area, this one. Uh, the lesser ones, like we like to call. So then along there are babies. These are shipment going to America in the next week or so. Uh, but they give you see. These are all barred. So it's quite nice ones. Uh, the uh, three is less than here, but we normally have 14 set up. But um, yeah, the same space. So, well, it's some nice room there, just here, so the other one. Yeah. And later on, these are, there's a bit of a divide there, because these are a little bit younger. And later on, are uh, more young men. These are all 20, 20 long. Yeah, it's nice to see. Side and indoor, uh, but they again also have outside access. And that's where you find them. Again, this is probably about 10 foot by 10 foot. So it's probably bigger actually, 12 by 12. Um, so yeah. And that's the three ages. So that was AV1. Now this is AV. See that? So we have 14 breeding cages in there. I'll put it in there in a minute. Really big outside flights. This is really just a breeding room. And quick 
30 to 3 and kids. These aren't all full at the moment. Uh, there's not many players left in here though and stuff. Um, oh, he's on a trolley to move to wheel your food around. Um, this is normally a baby cage. Um, you don't like them flying around too much, so it's a, it's a fairly nice size. Uh, up there is the resting place. So, these are all breathing. Once they get old enough, there's a lot of happens. Yeah, which we then transfer them into, into this bigger flight, so they do get a bit more exercise. But as you can see, these are all still very, very young. until maybe um, late September, we have a, a sort out. Uh, so we find it quite important to develop really well, uh, and then that gives us a chance to sell the, the previous year there. So this is AV number three. Uh, there's an outside flight. This is one of the sale flights, this one. Then that's the other sale flight. Uh, as you can see, this is our biggest flight. It's probably about seven foot wide um, and about 20 foot long. So what happens here is these, they're divided, but it doesn't, we, you know, we sometimes divide cocks and ends, so when people do, the babies are pretty quick. The babies also get access to still cages and areas to give them a benefit. And we are all making it useful to be said. Then we'll see the system of that. The heart of the other place. And we all have access to our side. Thank you. 
Um, Joe, did you want to do a little bit of commentating over there? Let us know your thoughts on uh, on some of them or just describe what's going on here. Yeah, sure. Uh, so that grey green hen, she's a 2017 and we still have her actually. Um, she won the Young Bear CC certificate at the BS Club show in 2017. Um, We've bred two off her this year, so she, our hens tend to last quite a while. We've got two 2016 hens paired up at this very moment. Videos are from Mobasis uh, Sata from uh, Pakistan. Uh, he's a good friend. I speak to him quite regularly. He's been here a couple of times. Um, he actually travels all over the world to visit the big top studs, so you can actually follow him on YouTube and you get some some great videos. Uh, this grey hen 
won the best opposite sex in show at the PS Club show in 2018. Um, she was the only bird to ever beat our grey for a certificate in 2017. She beat him for best young bear that one show. Uh, we've still got him, we've read off her this year as well. Lutino, he's done a lot of winning for us and he's bred some of our best Lutinos we've ever bred. He never went to a show without coming back with the CC. He always finishes quite high in the champion eight in the eight sections. Yeah, he's won the CC twice at the BS Club show, once as an adult and once as a young bird. This grey, or well that grey is the BS Club show in it. Double champion and still reigning champion for the third year, but we uh, unfortunately won't have any shows this year. Now, Joe, you were mentioning earlier that uh, in three years you've managed to breed 32 budgies off him, is that right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Uh, first two seasons it was high numbers, 14 in the first year, 16 in the, in the second. And then in the third year, they only, I think it was one or maybe two. Um, he went a little bit off in the cage actually, but due to... Um, medication that we use called Batril 2.5. It's an oral solution. Goes in the water. That is a godsend scenario. We, we save so many budgies with using that product. Uh, we can only get it direct from our vet. Um, and it's a repeat prescription once we need it. Yep, uh, fair enough. Um, I guess I had a few general questions before we get into the, the questions that are coming through from the audience here. Um, as a, a general rule, what do you guys keep in terms of budgery guys? You've, you have you showed us uh, three different aviaries there that you've obviously got all on the same property. How many hens, yep. how many cocks, and what sort of mix of young birds and old birds do you guys try to keep when it's all said and done? Yeah, well, around September we had a sort out of the young birds. We like to have around 150 to 170 young hens um, and about 150 young cocks and then adults on top of that. So your breeding season could be anywhere to three, four hundred birds. Uh, no, well more, five hundred in it. We've got 94 breeding cages, so there's a lot of movements. If bears don't get on within the first round, it's, they don't really get a second chance. It's quite, we have to be quite abrupt here. Um, obviously, super birds, we, we do give them two rounds, but uh, yeah, we, we, we like full legs kind of an instance because it's, it's big numbers to, to chase. So, as you may be seen on one of the breeding boxes before, we're up to 570 this year uh, and it's just the next round we're starting to hatch now so with about 35 40 still breeding 40 pairs still breeding we'll be happy to get another 40 out of them um, which kind of looks like that's what we're going to at the moment so so speaking of that what do you guys use to measure like a, a good breeding season how do you differentiate between a a good season, an average season, what, what do you use as metrics? Um, well, for years, we only ever ordered 460 rings, uh, but we, we, in the height of the breeding season, we would obviously go full throttle at a book come April, May time, we would slow right down. Um, but because the birds would be getting to a high level, we want to breed more for higher quality so we kind of breed into them months which then shifted us up to last year was 640, 649 um, and we could probably easily get maybe 40, 50 birds for the rest of this year so we'll be made up with 600. We were always happy with 460 
Um, but this year is, yeah, I've already told them. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, big numbers, but we breathe from a lot of cages. We do have a lot of, which everyone experiences, we kind of bears that let us down. Uh, but it doesn't mean to say when we sell them on, they don't produce for other people. Um, as I say, we're quite strict, so if you don't perform instantly, which is kind of harsh in a sense, but with how many birds we keep and we'd like to try, it's kind of a, a strict process. Yep, no, that makes complete sense. Now, one of the things I noticed uh, Frank talked about in a previous interview was that you guys have actually used five- and six-year-old cockbirds. You actually uh, were able to rattle off the ring numbers of them and produce some very good birds. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that and, and about, I guess, the longevity of yes. What I'll do, I'll pass you on to me, Dad, for this one. Okay. How are you, Frank? I'm good, thank you. And hello to everybody in Australia. Nice to uh, have the opportunity to speak to everybody again. Thank you for having me. And we'll do our best to uh, answer any questions. So we were saying about some of our older birds breeding till they are older years but the secret of that i believe is down to how you breed your birds we adopt a policy of no inbreeding we don't do any cousins together fathers with daughters any of that stuff no the furthest away the birds are from from being related the better and that way you will breed birds which will breed well be fitter and live longer and this is the reason why we still have birds who can breed when they're four to six years of age and they can still go out and win best in show particularly with some of the cocks last year we shown a spangle a Preston Budrigar Society Championship and he's one three seven of 15 and he was best in show. It's impressive. And he's also produced a couple of babies this year. So <laughs> we bred um, some super albinos last year, one of which went to the club show and won the CC, fifth champion young bird. And his father is number two of 15. And he bred again this year, several babies. That's, that's a very good outcome. Frank, to, to be able to keep them far enough apart, um, do you keep several different, I guess, uh, I guess they're not families as such, but lines, and do you, do you have to bring in a number of outcrosses to the study each year? How does that work? Yes. The also a big secret is, not necessarily a secret, but the way we do things is to bring birds of equal quality to what we're generally using if we can find them. And of course, we will only buy from people who also do not inbreed their birds. Because what is the point of bringing birds home that don't breed? People inbreeding their birds generally have poor breeding seasons and the birds they sell to you don't breed for you. So we steer clear of people like that. Okay. Um, Frank, one of the things that I noticed you'd mentioned previously um, in an interview a couple of years ago, you talked a little bit about feather down on babies between rounds. I'm wondering if you can share that experience with the group tonight. The feather down. You talked about the first round versus the second round versus the third round and the amount of down you were noticing on the babies. Well, yeah, obviously chicks are healthier at the first and perhaps second round stages. The down on our bed, I suggest, is created by the many, many birds we have brought in from Joe Manis in Germany, as his birds always had a thick down. Our birds are very well known for type of feather without being too buff. Yep. Now, if you start to take third round babies, you start then to run into trouble with them not being fed properly, etc. because parent birds are being tired. And you can maybe also in, run into French molt, 
which which is a problem when your adult birds become tired the immune system in the babies fails because the quality of crop milk starts to fail and therefore all kinds of things will happen to the young the young birds i would suggest only take two rounds and then foster third round eggs as they are being laid and then put the birds back in the flight if you do this these birds have roughly had a six month cycle for breeding and then six, seven months later, they are ready to again for your next breeding season. Adopting a policy of leaving birds to run on round after round leads to all kinds of problems with the youngsters and you tire the adults to the extent they will start to die off on you. One of the other things okay. I noticed um, in your comments here, you talked about in amongst 501 birds, you had one French Malta. And you mentioned about this program where you put the birds out the pasture, if you will. You know, when you're done with them, you date them as you put them into the, the flights. And it coincided with uh, feather plucking disappearing. So these well-rested birds that were well-fed uh, and well-looked after, you noticed that feather plucking, the down plucking disappeared. Can you share a bit of that with us? Yeah, well, we, two years ago, we did, start a regime of feeding a number of NAF, NAF products. These are horse powder produced products. And uh, we're going to show you some of them now. We started to add these to the soft food. Yep. And, and we've, we use several of them. We use a cushion A's product as well uh, there's products called O stress and magic we have these two here as well now these all have vital ingredients in them unbelievable vitamins every vitamin known to man is in these horse powders they're absolutely fantastic this O stress one as actually has a probiotic mixed into it which is uh, extremely good um, so uh, we believe these products added to the soft food in the last two to three years have virtually brought feather plucking and french malt to nil we basically hardly ever get a french malter or feather plucking and this of course is added to the to the germination soft food along with uh, s several items of a uh, sort of veg vegetable s sweet corn we we can't quite hear you joe it's okay. Well, we'll just shout them out. It's basically, you have all these things there as well, of course. Broccoli. Uh, we use beetroot on, a, on the store. S sweet corn. We use sweet corn out of a tin into the soft food as well. Watercress. So these things are all given to the birds virtually on a daily basis, along with the soft food. We also use various powders in the water daily essentials one which is a bird care company product this is added to the water when we pair breeding pairs as the chicks start to hatch we do not give this in the water we prefer to be a cooled water only which is being boiled of course the reason for that is I found we were losing babies quite a lot if we left the essentials one in the water once the babies start to hatch. So I think the, the thing to remember there is when we were all babies, mum would give us boiled water. <laughs> we wouldn't be getting any fruits or things in our water for obvious reasons. 
Okay. No, that, that makes complete sense. Um, Frank, in terms of the nest boxes, one of the things I noticed in the video, your nest boxes look about 12 inches high. They're some of the biggest yeah. boxes I've seen. Can you tell me why they're so big? Yeah, the reason for this is, uh, again, several years ago, well, when I say several years, I'm probably going back almost 15 years ago, I was disgusted and fed up with birds being attacked on the floor or leaving the box too early, sitting on the floor, not being fed, hiding behind food trays, etc., etc. So I came up with the idea of building a much deeper nest box. Now, the nest box, basically, when we make the pair, has dust free shavings right to the top, just under the hole, with a stepping block. So that the hen will lay her eggs away from the stepping block to the far end of the nest box. As the chicks appear, we will lower the shavings down right to almost the bottom of the box so babies, even at six weeks of age, could not leave the box. Therefore, they are fed and looked after to maturity. And in most cases, we move the chicks from the nest box to the stock cages. We use red millet spray cut up small when the babies are in the box. We're going to show you a, a sample of the internal side of the box if we can. Oh, I think you've got the wrong camera. We're, we're on the other camera. Can someone switch it? The, the lead guy can switch it. Is it Chris or is it Jonathan? Okay. Anyway, I think that we, we've explained, we haven't definitely shown you, you can see the nest boxes on the cages behind us, yep. huge boxes, the biggest you will probably ever see, from, they fill the, the space between the top and the bottom of the cage. Yep. So yep. they are basically saving us losing, perhaps, 30, 40 babies a year, which is a large percentage. And it's the, I found it to be one of the most upsetting things to come into the Avery of a night and find one of your best babies destroyed on the floor. Now, it, it, it's a difficult thing to describe why they do this, but I, I think in all walks of life, there's a little bit of jealousy amongst the sexes. So as a nice, lovely young hen comes out, mum gets a bit jealous. And this has always happened, I'm sure. Nothing new, we've, we've all experienced it. But we have made these boxes and it's almost corrected this problem for us. We still lose an odd one, but it, things will happen. No, that's good, that's excellent. Now, I have a, uh, an interesting question. You guys mentioned you have 94 breeding cages and uh, there's yourself, Joe and Carol. How do you work out who gets to do the pairing? Uh, well, Joe and I pair the birds together. Yep. We, uh, we will, with each pair that's made, we like to both be in agreement that we're doing the right thing for color, and for the benefit of the stud. We try to maintain a, a level amount of blue and green series birds. And of course, then we've got all the rare variety birds. Now, probably in the early days, I did make most of the pairings, but Joe is now a champion breeder along with the partnership. And he is now a very experienced budgie breeder and he gets better all the time so I do leave him to his own decisions at times he might make a pair of birds sometimes and out without consulting me and I'll come home from work and see oh 
where did they come from? <laughs> but when I look, he's he's made a good job, and I leave him to it. Yeah. We have a lot to do with lots of spare beds knocking around most of the time, so they have to be used when they're ready for breeding. So Joe and I both take part in pairing the beds up together or singly. Now, in terms of the pairings, Frank, do you have any aversion to any particular pairs? Like uh, do you pair opaline to opaline, double factor spangle to double factor spangle, dominant pie to dominant pie. Is there any? Right. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, there's obvious reasons. My my preference in the normal beds to start with to keep birds single factor. I like to put normal grey with sky blue. Mm -hmm. And the same, I like to put grey green with sky blue. So greys, grey greens you breed will be single factor. With light green, I like I, my preference with a light green is to prefer it, prepare it to grey green. Only that we don't have usually an abundance of light greens which are of quality of grey green to make pairs of light greens together. We try to stay clear of pairing grey factor birds together, grey, green and grey. Only that if you do this regularly, they will almost dominate the aviary and you'll have a problem breeding anything else. So single factor birds is what we aim to produce with the normals. We pair normals also with cinnamon and with opaline. But we do like to pair cinnamons together and also opalines together. My opinion is, particularly with opaline, if you've got fleck type opalines, when you pair them together, you actually clean them up. You make them more dirty by pairing them to normal. But I know we have to do this with, op with normal sometimes, pair them to opaline, because some of them can be a wee bit down on spot. So for me, the opaline corrects the spot on your normals and the cinnamon paired to normal stops your birds becoming too buff. It will give you that nice soft feather without, without the flecking. We don't have a lot of fleck birds except in our opaline. Now, a lot of the opaline cocks that we breed I put back to red eye, either be lutino or albino. So, for example, opaline grey green, split lutino, will be back to lutino. Opaline grey, opaline yellow face grey, back to albino. And it also, you mentioned there about spangles. I don't want a shed full of double factor spangles. So I would never put two double factors together. I like to breed spangles, so if I've got a good double factor, I will pair him back to a normal to even up the amount of spangles we breed, basically. Yeah. From that, you can expect some normals and spangles. Where dominant pies are concerned, never put two dominant pies together because I do not like double factor dominant pieds. They are virtually void of markings and don't have any spots in most cases. So dominant pie to normal is, or cinnamon, yeah. is good. Now, how do you improve the colour in your Lutinos? What? Sorry, say again? Frank, how do you improve the colour in your Lutinos? You've, how do we improve colour? I do like to dip into dark green with Lutino. My, my favourite pairing for Lutino is a Lutino cock to a dark green hen. Create your splits and, and your Lutino hens. And that's, that will keep the colour in the Lutino. Yep. Now tell me, in terms of this season, what are you guys trying to achieve with the birds? I mean, you being realistic, you've, you've won the BS Club Show with Best Young Bird. You've gone on two years in a row and, and won the entire show, Best in Show with, with a Cockbird. What are you, what are you trying, what, what element are you trying to improve upon 
within your birds this year? Is it lifting a level of consistency to the same? Is it a slight increase in width? Is it a slight increase in stance? Well, what are you what are you trying to bring into the birds? Well, to be honest with you, to maintain where we are is an achievement in itself. Each year, we we have very good quality in in all the varieties and colours that we breed. Obviously, and we are always trying to move forward. But you've got to be careful if you're thinking of moving forward that you don't move, use too many buff birds. This is the temptation, and then you end up with too many birds with no tails, etc. So we, we moving forward. Yeah, this year we decided we we were a bit down on on normal cinnamon. We've we've made several pairs to try and improve the cinnamon. So let's see, now we can show you some cinnamon family. It'd be a good opportunity. We have uh, some of these birds nope. to show you in cages. So I'll just pass you back the mic to Joe. Yep. Hello. Right, Troy. Uh, see the screen that's moving? Yes. Can Chris or Jonathan move it? So I think the you main focus is this screen. I think you'll have to take it off. Um, no. that, that screen will be on mute if you're dialed in twice. Right. right. Is that working? That's it. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Right. So, um, when we were going, we were, going for, we were trying to breed cinnamons this year was the goal. Uh, this is the parents that we thought well. These are a very ideal pair. Um, super hen, she spread out of a mill bed, and he was our visually best cinnamon from 2019. And then we produced babies. There's two cinnamon grey ends, one on the left. It's a bit rough at the moment, but she is a super hen. Lots of that's the mask and nice big round head and then the later round is two younger brothers uh, you can see there um, and as you can see we look, the cinnamon darkening is lesser cock but no chance of ever selling because he will hold the gene to breed birds like like so um, and there's actually 12 of them as a family. They're just four that I caught up the fly uh, earlier before. So uh, that's, that was a kind of the aim of what we were going for uh, this year on the cinnamons. So. Now, um, um, Joe, one of the questions we had for you, um, you guys obviously like the, the manor style of birds. What other European breeders when you talk about the outcrosses that you go in from from similar breeders, where do you typically get those from? Yeah, well, we we've never been anywhere else apart from Joe Man's abroad, have we? So we many years ago we used to many years ago we we used to visit a guy called Leo Endres. Uh, my dad can tell you the story about him. Uh, but as for outcrosses nowadays, uh, we've been to the Millers the past two years. Oh twice in the past three years uh, and we were doing little deals with other local breeders like Ian Ainley and Scott Ainley so um, yeah moving forward I'll, I'll pass you back on to me dad and he can tell you a little story of the Germany trips I suppose Hello again, Troy. Hey, Greg. Yeah, well, okay. You probably are aware of many of the good breeders in Europe, besides Joe Manis, but our temptation is to always to avoid them. <laughs> uh, I've always been a little bit reluctant in the term, stories of long flight and long tail with some of these people. Has, has put me off. So we we have maintained our level of quality. After the Joe Manis dates, uh, I went to Joe every year 
probably from 1999 to 2005. We bought an English stud of birds in 2008, which contained 230 birds. And that was uh, that the, the spangles were Frank Silver and the cinnamon birds were of Ian Ainley and Freakley. Those birds paired with our Germanus line has created more or less what you see today over many many years of line breeding. As Joe mentioned there, there are certain breeders of, who breed similar birds to us, not too buff, their birds mostly have tails and flights, they don't have long flight or long tail, the same as us. So we're very careful not to start bringing birds from somewhere which are going to change the structure of our birds. We like the way they are and we want to keep it that way. It's an English, basically a purebred stud of English birds with, with Joe Manus as, as mainly the, the, the background to how we've developed this line. Now, um, Frank, one thing I'm really interested to hear your comments on, obviously while you've got the microphone and not Joe, how do we encourage people like Joe, the, the younger generation, to come into the hobby? What do you think we can do in terms of, uh, I guess, making this hobby more sustainable? And what do you see happening over there? Or what do you think could happen that would, would improve that? Well, I think to improve any line of life, wherever you come into, it is about advertising. And I think the local papers, same as here, not just the, what you might call bird magazines, you know, your local sort of newspapers, that's where we need to advertise and encourage people to come into the hobby because it's something, until they read about it, they're not know, gonna know it's out there to become a member of a society. It, it's not just going to occur to them what happened with me mostly as a youngster, what got me into breeding budgies was every time I went into our local city centre, the first shop I got off the bus was a, a pet shop. And I couldn't help but going in there most Saturdays, a little look around in the pet shop. And we'd do that and then I'd go and buy an item of clothing have a little look around the town, back on the bus and home. And it was just something we did by habit. Now, of course, after a while, I thought, oh, I, I could have a little go of breeding these birds myself. And I'd probably been to the pet shop many, many times before it even occurred to me. So that the, the idea has to be put in people's minds. And you're not going to put it in people's minds if they don't see it in front of them. So it has to be in your newspapers and somebody has to spend some money to do it. Yep. They're not going to buy the, the BS magazine unless they've been encouraged into birds in the first place. I, I, so don't that. I, I believe this is the, the way forward. Yep. No, that makes sense. Now in some of the research I was doing, I understand you built uh, Joe his first bird room at 12 years old, is that right? Yes, we had uh, the third room you saw earlier was uh, when Joe was showing s such keenness to help in the bedrooms and stay. He, he would stay at all the championship shows as a boy. I would drop him off there with our team of birds and he would help a steward at the show and uh, collect him with the birds later in the day. And he has just gone from strength to strength so as a young man he became a junior we built his own bedroom for him and that is now our third bedroom and it's very very useful particularly today when the demand on our birds is the highest it has ever been so in there we have another 30 breeding cages yep. It's come in very handy. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. Now, on that same topic, um, Frank, what would you suggest as a beginner? What would you recommend? How do you think beginners can best learn? 
but well, he needs to go. You have to make a relationship with the best of your local champion breeders. You, you gain knowledge and go to see them. You get the experience of seeing how they've built their bird rooms, how they feed their birds. Most champion breeders will have a wealth of knowledge which you can't read in a book. You have to go sit, talk to these people, make friends of them. My, my, one of my best friends is, is Tommy Williams still and he taught me a lot about breeding budgies when I was a beginner. And we became such good friends. He used to go to Germanus with me when I visited Germany. And people like this are invaluable. So I'm sure wherever you live, there is somebody with a wealth of knowledge, not even maybe champion breeder, but somebody who has been at it maybe 10 years more than you have. They will be able to advise you in the right direction and hopefully sell you the type of bird which can get you started. I would say work with these people, watch how the results are on the show bench and obviously once you reach a stage where they can't give you perhaps the quality of birds you're looking for because your birds have moved on, you then have to visit what you consider to be the best breeders in your area. This is, the, this is where you will be able to buy, I'm sure, the best quality birds. Now Frank, one of the other comments that I'd seen you make previously was about um, crawling before you walk. And you suggested that a lot of these beginners that get into the hobby can become incredibly frustrated at the beginning by buying the birds that are more difficult to breed with. Yes, exactly. They need to, to learn on some of the lesser birds. Of course. Yes, as a young man, I, I first started to breed birds when I was 14. And I only ever used what you could describe as pet birds. I never, I never went to a show because my mum and dad didn't drive a car. <laughs> so until I was 22, I didn't start to show birds. I was a beginner then at 22, 23. I think I did my first show, 24 maybe. But of course I would had basically 10 years of breeding budgies before I went to my first show. So I knew how to breed the birds, but I wasn't sure what the exhibition bird was about. That makes sense. Now, so we basically, talking sorry about, Troy. Talking about breeding birds, one of the other uh, things that I guess was a little unusual for us, you're in the UK, I, I assume you get a, a, a lot of cold weather, possibly some snow, um, and you've got the outside flights. Do you think that the outside flights make the birds a bit more hardy? Yes, of course they do. We've always adopted the policy of outside flights. Oh, obviously in the summer months, they are of more benefit because we can let them out every day, whether it's raining, whatever the weather might be, because it's warm enough for them. But our winters are not as cold as they used to be here. And sometimes in November, December, we'll be letting them out not for all day, but for three or four hours and chase them back in mid-afternoon, early evening at the latest because they will stay fitter and, and breed better for it. It's all about fitness, getting the birds ready for, for breeding. The, the birds will be fertile if you've, if you've used uh, a lime breeding method, or they should be, and then it's getting them fit where they're not fat and carrying too much weight and that can be done by offering them indoor and of course outside flights as we so in, in the winter time do you use heaters or air conditioning or anything to, to keep the bird room warm i assume you breathe through winter in the summer we have heat keeping the bird room around 60 to 65 degrees fahrenheit 
We use, we, but we also have a, a large fan in the ceilings of each room, which helps to remove the dust. It, it also, obviously, in the winter months, will take away a bit of the heat, but you sometimes have to live with that to, to, to keep the air moving out of the bird room. But the birds seem to breed well. Uh, when we have the fans on, probably it does bring the heat down five or ten degrees at times. But we live with that to keep the air out of the bird room. You must have a constant flow. Otherwise, you can maybe end up with um, some things kicking off in the aviary through bad air, etc. Do you ever have any concerns with the open water bowls in terms of uh, transference of disease? Water bowls? Yeah, in your aviaries, I notice you've got the large uh, open water bowls. Oh, All right, yeah. Well, we do use uh, rabbit drinkers as well in the flights. But we, but in the in the in the warmer months, we do like to give them open water so they can bath and make best use of the water because it will basically be better for their feather if they can get a a, a good a good um, wash round in in these bowls. So it is changed religiously every, one, once every day. Yep. Okay. Yeah, out of curiosity, talking about changing water, how long do you guys generally spend tending to the birds each day? You're in there in the morning, you're in there at night. How long collectively as a, as a partnership would you spend in the bird room? Well, Monday to Friday, uh, Joe and I are at work till, till basically half four or five o'clock. We still have our small business we run. So we are not coming into the bird room till five o'clock, although Carol will have been at home all day and she will help with tidying up and doing some of the seed and water work. She's just said we haven't mentioned her name much tonight, so she's making the best of it. <laughs> so, but she is helpful in that she gets some of the things done before Joe and I come from work. Now, we stay out here till best part of eight o'clock. So between us, we've had six or seven hours between us. And that's enough to go around the nest boxes, put in the soft food, change the water on the, on the breeding cages. So at the weekend is different. We do cleaning mainly on a Saturday. And Sunday, most Sundays we have visitors or other plans so we we sort of um, don't do cleaning on a Sunday we, we we sort of in most Sundays we'll have visitors for the birds yep. okay. um, I have a, a slightly left a field up question for you um, that's come through on a chat what do you believe Frank is the hardest feature to maintain or improve on the bird well yeah, keeping, keeping the right length in the birds is important, but also maintaining the super cap, the directional feather, and the facial of the bird. Now, I know when you go to purchase birds, you'll nearly always be offered the, the shorter type bird in most cases. Because I think if you're offered a long bird with a super face, it's usually a bird that's it's got something wrong with it, maybe. So I, I think the way you do this, if you're offered shorter cocks, for instance, you've got to really be breeding your own longer hens at home because they are particularly hard to buy when they are young birds. This is how we developed our stud. The Joe Manis birds we brought back in those early days were, 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 were sort of sort of said to be a little bit too short to to be any good to us so what we did we had bred wonderful long hens from the Terry Pilkington line and Eric Lane birds which we bought in when we were novices so these birds paired to Joe Manor's birds gave us that longer bird but maintaining the super face and the cat now in the modern bird you will have heard of 
the termination of back skull. This feature is created through good shoulder and good feather behind the eye, which is what is referred to as back skull. The further back, you've got more chance of the shoulder coming together in the back of the neck of the bird, creating the modern bird look, which, you'll, which you can see on the best part of our birds. And they are basically make up our show team. But, they, but these birds breed very well for us as well. We have, we have managed to come up with a, a line of birds that uh, also show birds, fill eggs and breed well. well speaking of those kind Huge. of birds, Frank, what is, uh, I guess Joe mentioned earlier in the video, he said there was a cobalt hen on the floor of the aviary and he said that was the, the kind of hen you guys like to breed with. What can you describe that kind of hen to us? What you your preference of a hen, an ideal okay. hen? Okay, yeah, a, a, a typical breeding hen is what we've probably described, and you'll have heard this before a, a carrot shaped hen. So, a main feature is a, is a slim body, good shoulder, with a, with a good cap. We, we don't expect these hens to be cock-headed they don't have to be but they have to have width of head giving us the directional feather to meet with the cock because all our cocks we breathe with have, have very good directional feather so these hens have to be compatible it's no point pairing lesser hens to some of these cocks because you basically may send the quality of youngsters backwards. So, yeah. so we can show you some examples in a minute of the sort of hens that we use for breeding. But we do use the, the buff type hens if we breed them, because a lot of our buff hens do breed. So we try, we all, but our preference for hen is a carrot shaped hen with a good cat. Yep. Okay. Joe will show you a few samples of, of some of the... Uh, I'll just pass you back to Joe a second. Mm. All right. Back to some showing you some beds. Uh, right, so these are some young beds that we've bred this year. Um, Uh, well, that's sky blue, not looking very good anymore. Are we on the right screen? Yeah. Uh, I think the, the other screen is actually picking up every now and again your... All right. Is it working like that now? Is that better? That's perfect. Yeah. So these are just some numbers. They're the, they're the typical hens that we like to breed with. Is that the kind of hen? Well shaped, nice spots. Say it again. I was asking, is that the cobalt hen that we were looking at? On the yeah, I got there as a pike, as you, you mentioned that. So she's a, a typical hen that we like to breed with two tails, all of light, good feather. Same with the sky blue. Um, they're exactly, but these go to the likes of these types of cocks. You need to chat again, Joe. You've disappeared back to the screen. It is one of the best birds we've read this year. Well, it's a big bugger, as you like to call them. It's a lovely budgie. Yeah. yeah. So, again, he's got tails, he's got all the spikes, he's probably been on the bus side, but to rectify that problem, they're the type of hens that we will aim to pair into. So, is, is that, that alright? Thank you. Yeah, I'll just pass it back on to the dad one there. Yeah, Frank, another question for you. Um, in terms of the preference, Birds. You mentioned at the time of pairing up that you try to obviously, um, you're trying to line breed. Now for us in Australia, 
I think you were trying to describe it. Is, is that feature breathing? Is that correct? Sorry, I was just trying to get my head uh, gear on there. Could you say that again? I'd actually said if you answered that question in 10 seconds, you could have a million dollars, but you didn't quite get there quick enough. So I'm sorry. <laughs> so no, just, just um, mention that question again, sorry. The, uh, there was a question asked in relation to line breeding. And I think what you refer to as line breeding is feature breeding. Is that correct? So you try to... Yeah, feature breeding. Keep over a long period of time with, with feature breeding and line breeding, your birds will come together in a related form, but they will be distantly related with the same inherent features. This is, for me, the, uh, the idea of line breeding, is to breed from top quality birds, which will eventually come together as a stud of birds. You know that you've got it right when you're breeding as good or better babies from the parent birds. To begin with, with this type of breeding, line breeding, you, you may breed some birds which are disappointing. It's natural, you, but you keep and breed with the better birds and cross, cross the youngsters over to each other. Do you, do you have any problems, Frank, when it comes time to pairing up in terms of resolving birds that are related? Like when you pull them we out? Oh, I think we've lost it, Joe. Can you hear me, Frank? Say again, Troy, sorry. Just lost your picture there a second. That's okay. I was just asking the question, when it comes down, when it comes time to pair up out of the aviary, do you often run into issues with finding cocks and hens that aren't too closely related? If I do, they're not paired together. No, no, we have it's... such a large stud of birds here. We've enough? got so many options. Yep. Okay. In all, in all the varieties. Now, in, in terms of the varieties, do you, do you run any recessive varieties? We saw a grey yellow out there before in the Avery. Do you run Dilute. any? Well, they, those birds mainly come out of normal split dilute birds in the main. We don't pair dilute birds together. They are just popping out uh, from the birds we got in from Joe Manis from many years ago. And they still keep popping out. So <laughs> we, we don't mind, they are, they are wonderful budgies. They are indeed. Um, what do you guys use in terms of a record management system? So what do you use for your aviary management in terms of keeping pedigrees and knowing who's who? Yeah. Is? Well, we have, we have a stock, we, we keep things simple really. We have a stock book which holds everything that we need to know from the start of the stock book to the back. It starts off with the pairings that we make. It will, it will show all the adult and young birds we have in stock in the same book. So, so as we pair them up, we, we log everything in our book that those birds have left the flights for breeding. They are given a pairing number. As the youngsters are produced, they are listed in the same stock book. One to what is nearly six, seven hundred these days parent birds, comments next to that, and then there's a section for when the pairs have been breeding, the adult birds are re-entered back into the stock book, listed return to flight. If something's happened to them or we've decided to move them on, then this is also made note of. So everything, every little thing we do, is, is recorded in the stock book. Now, I know there are people out there who have a lot of time on their hands, maybe compared to me and Joe, who can, who can afford to sit and put it all onto a laptop, which Joe is perfectly capable of doing, but we don't find the need for it. We, we find it quicker just to work from the stock book. Yep, okay, uh, that's good. Looks like Joe's got a couple more birds for us to have a look at back there. Yeah, he has, yes. Yeah. Um, I'll, ch I'll pass you back to... You don't need it. All right, okay. You just need to make sure you talk at the, at the uh, laptop. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's all. Awesome. No.
Can you name me loud and clear? Perfect. Yeah, okay, so these are just four young Lucino cocks we've bred this year. Um, one of these will be going in a spot deal with uh, Ian Amy, I think. So he's up for it. Oh, what one, the one on the floor, he's, he's playing up a little bit, but he, uh, he's actually uh, a yellow piece Lucino, which we didn't mean to. Um, the Lucino hen that we paired up was bred off a uh, opaline dark green hen with a Lucino top. The opaline dark green hen, we didn't know it had a yellow piece. And we only realised that because her ne his nest mate is a yellow piece next to Sway, but he was we a bit baffled by them. Um, that's a good family to have, and you can see the yellow that well, we can from where we are. The yellow difference is it's a much deeper uh, yellow, but you don't want the blue series going into the, the albinos or the albinos. You'll obviously get the blue shining on them. Um, yeah, we'll just move on to show yeah, them some, some grey. As you know, we're quite strong in the grey department and that's where most of our success has come from. So, yeah, we've got this cage design for plenty of uh, greys to go in. So, yeah, there's your club still winner. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. I think, I think uh, Frank might have the microphone with him. Huh? You want me to put the microphone off? We need to turn the other microphone off because we're sticking to the screen on the other computer. Yeah. Yeah, so this is the. Uh, is that better? Yep. Is that working now? It, it was working until he asked if it was working now. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, it's, it's just a family of graves. There's probably three different lines of graves running through, yeah. Um, that's the main, is obviously the club show winner. And that's his brother. Um, so, unfortunately, he hasn't bred for us, but he's actually the only bird, I think, I should say, that hasn't bred. So, uh, these two are two sons of the club show winner. He's a, probably up with our best visual bears in the whole stud. So he's bred on very consistently, hasn't he? Yeah, well, it's it's the same features that we're, what we've had just been talking about in the, in the, in the previous bit, but you can see it, it, it runs quite throughout. Uh, this one on the right, that's a young bear, got similar features, he's still mounting through, so. Uh, um, Again, you give him a uh, couple of great cocks. This one on the right also a young bird, should we say. There's only two young birds in this group. Uh, this guy, he actually won a best in the show uh, last year, Clues Championship show. Um, that grey hen, he was the one was that in the previous video at the very start of the, of the meeting. He won best opposite sex any age in 2018. Uh, and there's a younger hen, as you can see here. Lovely style and feature. Yeah. This is a total different line of greys, these two. Yeah. Again, different feature, but these have got more feather. So, unfortunately, these don't have the tails, but these go to hens that. Um, obviously, have the, the double tail or the flight less less better because they will provide it for them. Uh, these are another two sons of the club show winner. Again, similar features but less shoulder this time. You're never going to get a consistent dominance. If you're going to breed 32 chicks, you're going to have a ranking of 1 to 32, just the way of the world. Um, and finally, they're just two big hens that, that do breed. They bred well for us this year, both of them. And they, again, they run in with the families. Very nice. That's the, uh, the great family. Well, I think uh, 
I think we've actually gone, I've just been through the side here, it looks like we've gone over most of the questions that have been thrown my way. Uh, is there anything else you guys wanted to share from your end? Well, I would like to say uh, a big thanks to Robert Manville, and I'm sure he's listening in somewhere. <laughs> I'm a bit worried. He uh, was one of the early people that came from Australia. Uh, he basically encouraged us to go to visit Joe Manis. And he, uh, he supplies us with some money to buy some adult birds, of which he got the young birds the following year. And that's what gave me the, the sort of input into Joe Manis to visit him and see his wonderful stud in those early days. And I still have regular contact with Robert Manville. Uh, we, we, we have become good friends, and this is the same with um, a lot of people I have been introduced with in Australia. And I hope Nigel Tonkin is well. I, I haven't heard from him for a few years, but I'm, I'm hoping he's still okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, any other questions then? Robert, if you want to, you can take your, your microphone off there for a second and say a quick uh, hello or a thank you. He is uh, he is happily watching you. I've noticed him drinking a, a short black, so I don't think he's going to go to bed anytime soon. He's, uh, he likes his... I can see him there. There he is. He's still on mute. Right at the bottom. He's giving you the thumbs up. He can hear you. So... Yeah. All good. Yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's grew a beard, I think. <laughs> a grey one like me. <laughs> yes, we all get old. All right. Well, I will. Um, I will pass you back to Chris. Thank you very, very much for taking a day off work once again, and a special thanks to Carol in the background. She's run around everywhere and hasn't had the name mentioned too many times. But uh, thank you very much to the McGovern family for for taking the time out today and sharing your stud with us and uh, showing us some wonderful budgies and uh, I guess sharing all your experiences with us too, your, your learnings. I'm sure a lot of people will have got a lot out of tonight. So thank you very, very much. Yeah, wish you all the best of luck. Good good breeding. And uh, keep well. well. What I would say as well is if any of have any questions, I'm available on Facebook. You can easily quite message me. So uh, feel free. Uh, everyone stay safe. Look after yourselves. Thanks everyone for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Roy. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Joe and Frank and Carol. We appreciate your time. Thank you very much for today. Troy, great job moderating again as per normal. Um, before we sign off, Troy, did you have we got confirmation on the next meeting? We have. Uh, our next meeting is, we're actually, we targeted to do a third Tuesday, but it's actually going to be uh, 